and this is Jake. You're watching Ryan Investigates. Have you ever wondered if the meatless media tells you the truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth? No. Don't worry. We take it from here. So, the whole idea for today's video came when I was watching a vegan YouTuber, Mike the Vegan, claiming that humans are herbivores because we, unlike omnivores and carnivores, don't have protein receptors on our tongue, and we also don't have fat receptors, which is why meat is tasteless. 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 Boy, that escalated quickly. Oh, I know this guy from my vegan phase. Most of his videos are heavily cherry-picked garbage. A perfect example of ideology-driven delusion. Just think about it. Protein and fat are essential, so it would be very counterproductive if nature had forgotten about this. And meat is tasteless? Has he tried tofu yet? I know, right? Anyway, dear audience, you're not alone if you think Michael's claims sound like a big stinking pile of bullshit, but you know what? Let's give him the benefit of the doubt and find out if any of it is true or he's just bluffing as usual. And in the meantime, we may as well learn a few things about the science and art of taste pleasure. Dr. Know-it-all, can we taste protein and fat? The short answer is yes, but let me explain. There are many natural ingredients in animal-based foods that could potentially reach the taste receptor cells on our tongue. There are hundreds of such compounds. There's even alcohol in meat. Not the kind that sits in oak barrels for years, I suppose? No. Oh, never mind. Please go on. The sensation of sweetness, not surprisingly, is mostly triggered by sugar molecules like glucose, fructose and lactose found in fruits, carbohydrates, honey and dairy. Okay. The sweet receptors on our tongue also react to a bunch of sweet proteins found in some exotic plants. I didn't know that. But meat also contains a small amount of sugar stored in muscles and the liver in the form of glycogen. Interesting. What is even more interesting, though, is that amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, also have a taste that activate the receptors on our tongue. For example, glycine, the main amino acid in collagen, one of the most abundant proteins in the body of animals, is actually so sweet that when it was first isolated, they called it the sugar of gelatin. The word glycine is derived from the Greek word sweet. Oh, did you know that scallop is sweet and buttery because it contains glycine in very high amount? Boring. Just give it up. Nobody watches your videos. I know facts may not be as exciting as fiction, but we've come here to learn. If you prefer pseudoscience, go and watch Mike the Vegan. Please go on. So, sweet flavor in meat comes from sugars, amino acids, and organic acids. The bitter receptors on the tongue react to several substances, such as carnosine, found exclusively in animals, which has a number of benefits like antioxidant and cardioprotective properties, improved brain function, anti-inflammatory effects, and slowing down aging. Some amino acids are also bitter, like methionine, which gives the unique taste of sea urchins. Are you with us, Michael? Actually, leucine, which is the most effective at promoting muscle protein synthesis, has such an extremely bitter taste profile that masking its flavor in protein powders is a challenge for the sports nutrition industry. Luckily, most amino acids in meat are combined into peptides and complete proteins, so we don't perceive them as unpleasant. What about umami? I hear a lot about it when it comes to the taste of meat. Umami means the essence of deliciousness in Japanese and is usually described as a meaty taste, but it can also be found in aged cheeses, broth, fish, oyster sauce, tomatoes, mushrooms, fermented soybeans, seaweed, and many more. And what's the scientific explanation for the umami taste? 
umami serves as a signal to the body that we have consumed protein. In this image, we can see T1R1 and T1R3, a pair of taste receptors that are activated by most of the amino acids that go into making protein, but the most strongly by aspartate, glutamate, and the nucleotides inosinate, adenylate, and guanylate. I hope you're taking notes, Michael. Interestingly, we also have amino acid sensing receptors in our gastrointestinal tract. Can you tell us about glutamates? Glutamate, more precisely glutamic acid, that the body turns into glutamate is an amino acid used to form proteins. Humans encounter it already in the womb, as the amniotic fluid contains glutamate, and it's the most abundant amino acid in mother's milk. But of course, we don't lose the ability to sense this amino acid after weaning. Yeah, our taste buds die and grow back about every two weeks, so it would be a massive waste of resources if it was only for tasting our mother's milk. That's right. Glutamates in foods plays an essential role in the umami taste, but the receptors are activated by a range of amino acids, organic acids, short peptides, and display a particularly strong response in the presence of nucleotides. Nucleotides? What are they? There is a molecule called ATP that is essential in the energy metabolism of living things. Think of it as a battery. Okay. When those living things die, ATP starts to break down into free nucleotides. As animals need more energy to move around, their ATP demand is much higher than in plants, so the number of nucleotides will also be much higher in their decomposing body. What is interesting is that the umami receptors on the tongue react strongly to them. Did you hear that, Mandy? That means delicious. We have receptors designed to sense the taste of corpses, all approved by Mother Nature. Checkmate, Michael. Their effect on taste is known as the umami synergy, which means that the perception of meaty, savoury taste will be the most intense when glutamate and nucleotide-rich foods are eaten at the same time. That's one of the reasons why the presence of meat that is rich in the nucleotide inosinate greatly enhances the taste of food, making eating more pleasurable. Makes sense. Scientists call it flavour potentiation, when the response to a mixture of two components is greater than the sum of their individual responses. A rare case of 2 plus 2 equals 5. This won't make the herbivore people very happy. Facts don't care about feelings. Doctor? The best Japanese restaurants are known to use a 1 to 1 glutamate inosinate ratio in their fish stocks. I feel like I'm in umami heaven when I'm eating seafood ramen. Even my dog loves the smell of it. Actually, there's an interesting research paper that compared the nerve responses to umami substances in rats, dogs and humans and concluded that the extent of the synergy between glutamate and the nucleotides in dogs that are definitely not herbivores and humans was much larger than that observed in rodents. In other words, the canine taste response to the umami substances resembles those in humans. Who's a good boy? I'm a good boy. Dead means delicious. Who's a good girl? I'm a good girl. Damn delicious. Wow, doctor, you really know it all. It's more than enough to prove that we can sense protein. What about fat? Every steak lover knows that fat means flavor. That's right. Fat in food has great palatability for humans. We can sense fat by its texture and smell, and there is a growing body of evidence that we have cells in our mouth that recognize fats. What are these receptors? The most likely candidates for lipid sensing receptors are CD36 and GPR120. Besides that, when we ingest fat, the glands under our taste buds release a fat-digesting enzyme called lingual lipase that starts to break down fat. Why would we have those enzymes in our mouth if we didn't taste fat? Michael? Please do continue, Doctor. Last but not least, we shouldn't forget about the greatest human invention. Cooking, heating meat, generates hundreds of volatile compounds that contribute to the pleasant smell and flavor we associate with meat. What happens when we cook meat? A low heat, slow cooking method will produce lipid degradation products, while high heat, fast cookery, generates more Maillard reaction products. Maillard reaction? Is this the reason why steaks turn brown? Yes, but it's important to distinguish it from caramelization, which only involves sugars, while the Maillard reaction in meat happens when the sugars naturally present in animal tissue react with protein. Protein and sugar? 
Well, yes, as we know, a big portion of meat is protein which reacts with ribose. It's a sugar that can be found in the mitochondria of animal cells. Am I right in saying that we likely evolved a taste for cooked meat? Absolutely. Enhancing flavors by cooking is not exactly a recent phenomenon. Humans started to use fire hundreds of thousands of years ago, or possibly even earlier. The success of our ancestors was down to discovering how to access food rich in calories and protein. Looks like meat is not tasteless after all. That explains the fake meat paradox. The what? You know, while poor deluded Mike is trying to convince us that eating meat is unnatural, others are busy making heaps of flavorless plant-based junk look, feel, and taste like animals. Yeah, it's hilarious. They even add red coloring so that it resembles a ground-up corpse. Oh, and you must love those cute fake bones. There is something just fun about eating messy, delicious ribs straight off the bone. So today we're making a vegan version of a rack of ribs. They should be about a half inch apart and sticking out of the dough a half inch. Now cut off long, thin strips and press it on the base of the bone and then wrap it, tucking in the ends. This technique is what is going to allow us to eat the meat right off the bone without it just straight up falling off. Don't you feel a little cognitive dissonance here? Vegans have an explanation for this. Check this out. Why do vegans want their food to look like meat? For the same reason people use dildos. Looks the same, feels the same, fills a hole. No hearts broken in the process. Oh, this is the dumbest analogy I've ever heard. Where did you find this? On a vegan propaganda channel called Plant Based News. They also have videos promoting that humans are actually herbivores. We have the choice to behave as what we actually uh, and I'm sure you'll hear about this later, are designed to actually thrive on as an herbivore and eat lower on the food chain, directly eating the plants that this earth grows and produces. I wonder on which tree does fake meat grow? Yeah, just take a look at their Facebook page. Vegan bacon, vegan egg, vegan fish, you name it. If humans were herbivores, why would vegans want to make plants taste, feel, and look the same as meat in the first place? That's what I call the fake meat paradox. At least they admit that their brain craves the real thing. Obviously. By the way, Mandy, does fake really feel the same? Not even close. Whoever said it's the same is lying. But seriously, why do we want to recreate the taste of animals and not the other way around? Why does the ultra-processed food industry spend billions of dollars to reverse engineer the flavors in meat? You know, the flavors that don't even exist according to Mike, the science denier? Imagine spending the same amount of money to imitate the bland taste of vegetables. That would be silly, right? The funny thing is that people always craved meat, apart from some devout religious fanatics who denied themselves all the pleasures in the world. Take the Seventh-day Adventists, for example, a Christian sect that grew out of the doomsday cults popular in the 19th century. Let me guess, meat was off the table. Those Bible thumpers waged a war on every pleasant thing we enjoy. One of them was the famous John Harvey Kellogg. The inventor of cornflakes? Yeah. Also a fierce enemy of masturbation, or self-pollution as they called it back then. What? He considered it as an awful sin against nature and God. He writes about it in his book, Plain Facts for Old and Young. A dreadful sin. The sin of self-pollution is one of the vilest, the basest, and the most degrading that a human being can commit. It is worse than beastly. Those who commit it place themselves far below the meanest brute that breathes. The most loathsome reptile rolling in the slush and slime of its stagnant pool would not be mean itself thus. Oh gosh, what a weirdo. He was obsessed with dietary and sexual abstinence. He said, The passions are aroused if your diet is not pure enough. So no meat, eggs, alcohol, tea, coffee, chocolate. Even spices were a temptation that leads to sin. He must have been a bundle of fun. Another fun fact about Kellogg's is that he allegedly never consummated his marriage during the 40 years he spent with his wife. Fantastic. Celibacy and a diet of bland cereals. What could be less exciting? But at least these zealots got one thing right. Eating animals gives us pleasure. Big time. Well, it feels good to be nourished, doesn't it? Vegans are also aware of this. That's why militant animal rights activists try to downplay the importance of taste, as if it was just a minor, trivial thing. All of this for what? It's because it's not for nutrients, is it? It's for people's taste pleasure. What about for taste pleasure? Taste pleasure. For taste pleasure? Taste pleasure. Raising them, uh, breeding them into existence and killing them for taste pleasure. For a tiny bit of taste pleasure. For a small amount of taste pleasure. Um, 
it, it, this is a mass holocaust. The taste pleasure, the momentary fleeting taste pleasure. It's fleeting taste pleasure. If you think of fleeting taste pleasure that lasts about three minutes in your mouth. Five minutes of like taste pleasure on my tongue. Five minutes taste pleasure, there's a cow there, happy cow. Daisy, let's call, it, call the cow Daisy, very stereotypical cow. And I shoot the cow on the back of the head. Do you think that because you gain pleasure, like taste pleasure, yeah. that that justifies uh, cutting the animal's head off to eat yeah. them? Well, yeah, sometimes, because a lot of people, there's a lot of animals out there, who cares? Taste pleasure, disgusting. Wait a second, did the guy say five minutes of taste pleasure for shooting Daisy? I couldn't eat a chicken, let alone a whole cow in five minutes. Just one cow can provide a person with meat for more than a year. Exaggeration and thinking in absolutes is very common in cults. Or replacing facts with fiction. Am I right, Michael? <laughs> Misinformation certainly helps to recruit new members. But there's a much simpler truth we can learn here. Which is... What the girl said. That we don't care? We care more about the well-being of our own species. I don't see a problem with it. That's what every species does. We are humans, so we put humans first. <laughs> On that note, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you our guest, an associate professor at Forward University, a doctor of psychology, Stephanie Soy, who recently published a book called Happiness on Your Plate. Thank you for inviting me to the show. My pleasure. Professor, in your book you write a lot about the spiritual connection to our food, so I'd like to ask, what's the secret of meat? Why don't we feel such a primal attraction to broccoli? The nutritional quality plays a major role in why animal-based dishes are fundamental in our culinary culture. Meat and other parts of most animals are a very good source of nutrients that are ready for the body to metabolize. Complete proteins, essential fatty acids, and bioavailable micronutrients. All in a compact and tasty package. That's the secret of meat. Cows find grass tasty. Gorillas will happily chomp on twigs and their own feces, and nobody questions their dietary choices. Why is that? Taste is a motivation for an animal to eat what they're supposed to eat. We also have our preferences. The human brain rewards us when we sense calorie-dense, easy-to-digest, nutrient-rich food. Dr. Know-it-all, what's your take on this? Our brain is built for pleasure. Nature has a smart trick up its sleeve when it comes to the survival of animals. Pleasure. So just like procreation, the production of offspring, eating is also rewarded with a pleasant feeling. The brain scans of subjects who tasted glucose, glutamate in the form of MSG, and the IMP nucleotide, which is typically obtained from meat industry byproducts, revealed that sweetness and umami are registered in very similar areas of the brain. Yeah, as a child I didn't accidentally pick out the meat pieces from the soup and left the veggies in there. Just look around in restaurants and see what we like to put on our plate. It's not cornflakes. It's pointless to deny who we are. Meat eating is ingrained in our identity. But should we feel guilty for wanting to put on our plate what our parents ate? And the parents of their parents? The sad guy in the video was definitely not happy about it. He obviously oversimplified a complex question to fit his agenda. A very common tactic used by snake oil salesmen, by the way. It all boils down to the same principles that made Homo sapiens rise above all other species. We are the big recyclers of what nature can provide. There's us and there's them, humans and their resources. And this includes animals too, right? Animals are useful to us. They serve a purpose in our society. The word meat actually comes from Old English and originally meant food, nourishment, sustenance. In most cultures, meat has high value. But even if we ignore our evolutionary history or how easily the nutrients in animal foods are digested and absorbed, tradition, convenience, and the thousand different uses of their byproducts, we shouldn't forget. Eating is much more than just physical need. For most people, taste is extremely important because enjoying what we eat is necessary for our happiness. I feel a little unhappy. I want to eat a ribeye steak right now. Am I too selfish? Let me put it this way. The pleasure of eating a meal may only last for 15 minutes. The satisfaction that comes with it will last for many hours. The food we love means joy, comfort, satiety. Some of the most important moments of our lives. Kellogg's and his disciples entered the chat. Taste is a rich, rewarding experience, and people naturally feel that they miss out a lot if they can't unlock the full potential of their taste buds by giving up meat. Yeah, it's like a self-imposed disability. You must be really motivated to do it. Motivated or brainwashed? Taste pleasure. Disgusting. 
And there's the social aspect. A heartwarming, nourishing meal connects people. It brings us together. So looking at it from this angle, taste pleasure affects our mental health too. It improves the quality of our life. I'll go for whatever ticks the most boxes. Let's be honest. Potatoes and rice are called side dishes for a reason, right? You do you. If eating an omnivorous or a completely plant-free diet brings you benefits, I say go for it. For some people, it's more of an ethical dilemma. Not for me. Well, for a tiny but loud minority anyway. The way I see it, the vast majority of humanity has always agreed that eating meat is a normal and morally justified action. And as long as people have control over what to have for dinner, it will stay that way. We can keep improving the conditions under which the animals are raised and slaughtered, but at the end of the day, only one thing matters. We want to eat animals. I can live with that. What about you? Let me answer this question in the most serious manner I can. Hell yeah. Fire up the grill and bring the dead bodies, baby, because my taste buds want to have some real pleasure today. You're crazy, Jake. But I love it. Ryan, can you sing a song for us now, please? My pleasure. Can I have some chicken wings? Oh, and a leg too. Make it two. That'll do. My pleasure. Could you pass the brisket, please? And that yummy cheese. Broccoli. No thanks, I don't eat trees. My pleasure. Cheers, mate. Let's eat some fish. Smoked salmon? What an awesome dish. My pleasure. Venison and red wine? The taste is divine. You forgot the salad? No worries, I'm fine. Michael, please delete your video.